All right, guys, it's time for the next level guy show. A men's interview, interest, and improvement focused podcast featuring interviews with the greats from all industries to help you better your life. Each week, a new episode features an interview with one of the greats covering all aspects of their story from life hacks to tips and protocols that have allowed them to live life on the next level. We then highlight concrete action steps that you can use to improve your life. And now, your host, Ian Dawson McKay. And today's guest is Coach Tom Davey from the Grappling Academy. Coach Tom began coaching Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the early 2006. He's been fascinated by grappling for close to 20 years and spends his days devoted to furthering his art by teaching and studying Brazilian Jiu Jitsu full time from dusk till dawn. As a college graduate with high academic credentials, Coach Tom continues his commitment to excellence by teaching Jiu Jitsu to students worldwide. With a unique ability to teach techniques with a high level of detail in an easy to understand manner, Coach Tom's goal is to spread the knowledge of Jiu-Jitsu to all corners of the globe and help as many people as possible experience the wonder of the gentle art. Coach Tom Davey is the South Australian head for BJJ Australasia under 5th degree black belt John Will and holds a black belt under 8th degree coral coach Carlos Machado. In this interview, we discuss the topics of BJJ, whether you should compete or not, and why it might be the best thing you ever do if you do. To be transparent, this interview was recorded a while ago, a few months into the pandemic, and it's been raging on for a lot longer since. However, all the great tips and hacks that Tom offers are just as useful today as they were when they were recorded. My mic is a bit off, and the sound quality is not great in some places, and I hope that's not too off-putting. And now, let's get to the interview. It's so awesome to have you back on. You're still one of my favorite YouTubers. You're still one of my favorite coaches. You're still one of my favorite guests of all time. And I'm delighted when you want to come back on. But just a quick sort of reminder for those who don't know the name, can you just give a quick shout out of who you are and why you're a legend in the sport? (laughs) I think you you should be my hype man, Ian. But thank you very much. I love being back. I was definitely super keen to do round two with you. I know how much we both enjoyed round one and hopefully some of your listeners did too. But um, yeah, so I'm a full-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach, uh, black belt under coral belt, Carlos Machado. And uh, I spend about nine or 10 months a year in Australia running my full-time academy. Um, I also have my online business the grappling academy and we've got like i know five or six hundred youtube videos up and uh yeah i teach and compete overseas for the other few months a year um no complaints i have two amazing kids at home i uh happy happy living my life and i'm looking forward to today's conversation awesome well you're still one of the most popular guests i've had on people love your sort of approach your you know your fun your enthusiastic approach but also the detail you put in your videos and it's something i'm considering doing just now is competing for the first time and i know a lot of people who are going back into jiu-jitsu with that kind of intention after the you know the covid19 yeah so can it be delight it'd be brilliant to talk about competing for the first time as such because most people go to their classes they come out and you know they they just do the routines, they have a bit of a role at the end and leave. But, you know, for people who are thinking about competing, can you just give a little bit of a sort of background about that making that change from, say, a hobbyist to competitor? Is there a kind of mental shift? You- well, to be honest, I actually don't see there being a difference. I mean, look, at a world-class level when there are professional athletes doing it, um, then yes, you know, that's when I would say you go from hobbyist to like a competitor is when that's what you do full time. Most of the competitors I know, men and women with multiple medals at worlds and masters worlds and stuff, I consider them to be hobbyists. You know what I mean? Um, Some people would consider me a professional because I get to do jujitsu all day. I get to you know, do conditioning training every day because I don't have some normal job that's, you know, sapping my time and energy. Uh, Yet then sometimes when I'm over competing at Worlds and especially at Black Belt and you'll get a guy who's just 
this is his full-time job. He just can, like, this is what he does. He doesn't teach even. Like, this is just what he does. I'm like, oh, that's a professional. <laughs> but, um, so for me, I think, hobby, like, everybody should compete in jiu-jitsu once. And everybody goes through, like, this big stage of the first time. And it's like... It's like getting in a street fight in slow motion over six months. Like it's um, it's an interesting thing for men and women to go through. Yet I think in my life, Ian, competing in jiu-jitsu, regardless of the outcome or belt level, I've competed at every level. Um, I think it's probably one of the most powerful self-development tools I've ever been exposed to. That's not why I did it per se, but why I would do it again. Absolutely. I think for me, growing up around violence and stuff, when you compete, you're acknowledging the fact that you're going into danger, you're backing yourself and you're saying, I'm going to be okay with the outcome with regardless of what happens. Your teammate and coaches are going to think good of you. So, I mean, for me, I don't think you should, I think everyone should compete. In fact, I think everyone should compete in jiu-jitsu in their first year of jiu-jitsu. Now, you may not want to compete again, but I think competing at least once or at least once at every belt level is something we can do to make sure that we're on the mats, not just getting better physically, but mentally as well. Because I think that's where I made the initial mistake was for a white belt. I went, oh, I don't know enough. You know, I had a friend who went and competed. And at the time, I was like, no, nope, not fair enough. Can't do it. And now when I got my blue belt, I was like, yeah, right, perfect. I'm going to pick. I'm going to do six months from now or nine months looking for, you know, the next competition. And then suddenly all the gyms get shut down. <laughs> so what would, you say, I mean, what would you say to people just now who are either going back or still laid off, you know, with lockdown? Is there things that like the just the general uh, jiu-jitsu practitioner should be doing during lockdown, you know? Would you advise things like getting a grappling dummy, buying instructionals? Are these things really helpful at all? Because I've read and seen some of your videos where you've kind of talked about, you know, it's not as good as rolling, but, you know, do you still believe that kind of thing? I mean, I definitely think. I think there's nothing wrong with drilling, be it on a dummy or a regular person. Um, the advantage of a dummy is you're more inclined to do the amount of reps to really code you know, that technique, for instance, into your body, uh, more or less, you know, that's a very rough use of terms, but, um, you know, whereas you're just not going to do 200 arm bars to your mate. You're just not like, he's not going to let you do it. And if he does let you do it, he ain't letting you do it next week, Ian. <laughs> so, like, I think the grappling dummy has that advantage, um, that you can do hundreds of reps so that when you hit that armbar from guard in the last 10 seconds of competition, you're not thinking. Your body is just acting or reacting. So I do think they're very good like that. I think solo drills have their place. Um, look, uh, this is going to sound incredibly crass, but I, I will say it and I'll let you edit it out if you feel this isn't appropriate. <laughs> Makes me want to say it even more now. But I was asked this question just by one of my students who's a good friend of mine. And I said, look, it's like all this solo training stuff. It's good, you know, but I guess it's like it's like masturbating, Ian. It might seem fun for a while, but once you have the real thing, it doesn't seem as fun anymore. And I feel like you just... <laughs> You know, like we've had these classes and we're rolling and we used to think it was like bad and then it stops and we just want to go and get smashed again. We just want to go and get tapped out and everything. And no, I don't think there'll ever be a replacement for that, nor the other metaphor I use. But I um, I do think yeah. that um, that when what you can do at home that no one's talking about right now is actually sometimes the nothing part, like go do other conditioning, go do other work, keep your mind fresh. So when you come back, you can do the next 10 year push to black belt or however long to people have in their journeys and uh, give your body and brain a break. Um, now that's like not super positive and active advice, but I think it's also just real advice because everyone I know Ian who's tried to do their solo training or like virtual training, you know, no one's really loving it. And I'm, I'm still, like, there are no COVID cases in my state, Ian, um, literally zero. And um, I'm still unable to open my gym. So I'm begging to roll. I feel like 
oh, just going out and wrestling some random person in the street. Although that is frowned upon in our society, I found. <laughs> It is weird, and it's that sort of mental masturbation, like you're saying. There's people sitting there going, "I'm going to get a train dummy. I'm going to do fifty thousand reps. I'm going to, and I'm just sitting there going, "I'm done, bugger all. Like I've just kind of come in, I've created my podcast, did my work, you know, kind of thing, just go on with it." And the thing is, we're all going to go back at that exact same point of having. I mean, for as it's for we know about two months off, and I mean, it was only meant to be locked down for a couple of weeks, and now I think we're getting to that point. You know, you're seeing people who are getting desperate for it. You know, you're seeing like the benefits of jujitsu and the sort of competition. But for those people like who are maybe afraid of competing, you've got a great video on overcoming fear, you know, with auto replacement techniques. Could you go into a little bit about that? Because I found that video really helpful, but a lot of people kind of go, oh, no, no, no. I couldn't possibly go and compete against somebody that wanted to, you know, it's all right on my training partner or my mate, but. To actually go and do that, I'd be too embarrassed in front of somebody. So how can we get over that bullshit approach? Uh, and, what, and what you just said there, I think, isn't that that's like the tip of the iceberg that everyone faces. We all hit, like, I don't know of anyone who's competed that hasn't had those feelings that you just expressed. And everyone listening to this in jiu-jitsu knows what I'm saying to be true. There are men and women who do their best to give a bit of bravado and tell you that that isn't in their thoughts. But everyone has that. I think it's human instinct. I think we're afraid of, you know, if we don't perform or we don't live up to our potential, we lose our place in the pack. And that was probably true, I don't know, thousand years ago you know you miss a few antelope with the old spear and you you know you spear your caveman buddy and you probably are kicked out of the cave at that point you know <laughs> um, you know but it's not the case in our society and i've known students who have lost their first seven eight nine ten eleven matches like straight no wins you know say two events three events four events not a single win and I think jujitsu gave the most to them because that gave them a very firm statement that even when they fall on their face in front of their friends, family, peers, mentors, and people who also look up to them, that not only do their fears not come true, but they get a tremendous sense of respect, both from their immediate community, but also from, more importantly, themselves. I think it's just an instant self um, esteem, I guess, like increase it. Like your self concept, I think, raises as you win or lose, because it's going to be about 50 50. Like that's how averages kind of work. Um, you know, and it, nothing bad happens when you lose. Good things happen when you lose. You realize that your fears were just rubbish and that not only were they not real or valid, but they were actually the opposite of the truth like the very opposite of the truth. So for me, that was my biggest lesson, like that I took out of it was not being afraid to fail, not being afraid to try. And even to the point where I developed my grappling style and to go away from winning at the start, I put so much pressure on myself to win and I got myself so down and things, Ian, like white, blue belt, you know, I really did. Um, and it wasn't until sort of like black belt, I reckon, and brown belt that I stopped caring about the outcome so much that I began to just develop a really aggressive jiu-jitsu style. And I like out of my black and brown belt matches, like if I win, it'll be in the first 45 seconds by submission, you know? And if I lose, that's fine. It might also be like that. But uh, I began to want that more. Like I was willing to take less wins if it meant I felt better about my performance and um, yeah that's just some of the benefits it's given me but to anyone listening I would say just jump in sign up you're going to feel the fear your body's going to try to give you excuses to I don't know pull out or but don't don't write yourself off before the competition and say I'm probably going to lose and it will be okay go in there to win believe in yourself but I've found personally, Ian, when it comes to competing, you can learn one thing per competition. So the first thing people learn is how to face their fears because as soon as they click submit on their payment button, they're scared to fucking death and they have to just face their fears and honor their commitment 
And um, that's like the first thing. And then I find it's like you've got self-belief that needs to come in there. So then you can't write yourself off before the tournament. Then you've got like a, a self-respect thing where you've got to do the amount of preparation prior to, you know, your, uh, your event. And so I feel that like every event you do layers you up. Um, do I think any excuses not to compete are valid unless you've competed enough to just not want to do it? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally think that anyone who doesn't compete has an excuse. Everyone who doesn't compete has an excuse. And when you acknowledge that an excuse is just an excuse, <laughs> um, you realize that like, you go, why am I holding myself back? Like, I'm not going to get injured. I get injured in training, not competition. Other than having said that, Ian, I would just say if there are any black belts out there, uh, if you want to play leg locks on black belts and stuff like that, you will get injuries. Um, I know I've caused more than I've received, yet I've also received plenty. So uh, that's the only caveat I would say. I would say try to get it out of your system for black belt because it gets a bit serious. <laughs> Well, that's actually one of my worries is because I, I compete with uh, Gracie Barra and they don't do leg locks in training. And every time I see somebody smashing through people, it's always that they do leg locks. And I start going, ah, I don't know that side of the game. <laughs> right? Is it John Is it John Danner when he's saying about why I ignore 50% of the body? Or it might be Craig Jones, I don't know. But... I believe he was the one who probably first coined that phrase. I mean, it's certainly been around in jiu-jitsu a long, long, long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I was into doing leg locks, uh, before, uh, before upper body stuff, like the first submissions I learned were leg locks. So some of us learned it backwards, but when you've got a good competitive gym, like for instance, you know, you train with Gracie Baja, like, uh, I love Gracie Baja. I do some seminars for some different Gracie Bajas. Lots of my friends train at Gracie Bajas. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I think that like, the hardest people to often leg lock sometimes can be the people that don't train them because they're not playing the game. If you play a leg lock game with me, like you best have played it for 20 years. Otherwise I'll probably come out on top. Um, you know, but if you don't play it at all, then that's, that's actually can be beneficial. So I don't think people need to worry if they haven't practiced leg locks. Like the worst case scenario is you get caught in a foot lock. Like it's only blue belt and you tap like, even if your foot pops in a straight foot lock, and I should not say this, but having popped so many straight ankle lock foot locks and having had it done to me a million times in competition and training, you know, you just limp for a couple of days and then you feel fine. Like, it's not too bad. I mean, don't don't take my word for that, Ian, you know, but that's just what I've done. But um, well, holds and knee bars. It's are- like any choke, isn't it? You know, any choke kind of feels like absolute murder while it's on. Two seconds later, you're like... Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, no, it's it's nothing. No one stopped you tapping at any point, like you know, like <laughs> you can just say, so "Hey, cut a jitter." I've always, I've always been a quick tap. Uh, for me, jujitsu competition, I actually tap uh, in jujitsu competition. I would say, like, relatively quickly. Like, if I really put my competitor hat back on, which I may do so, you know, once the world's competitions reopen, I was sort of very burnt out with competition, to be honest with you. But um, if I was to refocus on it again, I would truly refocus on it and I would like want to never tap. But for me, jiu-jitsu competition was all about self-improvement. And that's just not qualitative. That can be like a direct, actual, specific effect on your jiu-jitsu based on that. So if you and I are in a match and uh, you fall back for a footlock and I've never practiced a footlock and I tap and I go, you know what? I best not practice open guard if people know footlocks or I best learn footlocks because that was a really good attack. And I would always view competition like that. It was like you get to go to war with friendly people and you get to find out your system. So for me, because I was a coach from white belt onwards, I I spent a long, 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 many years at white belt. So it wasn't normal white belt. But uh, I think for me, like I would want to tap early in competition, which is not good for results. But I hope that gives some of the listeners an idea of where I think the importance of competition lay. And it's not in results. It's all about process and outcome and not the outcome of the match. That's out of your hands, whether you like it or not, really. The outcome in yourself following whatever happens. And I've personally found um, 
that uh yeah if i would tap in competition like i would actually i would tap if there was a submission on look i'm a pretty strong guy i can fight out a lot of things and like you know risk a little bit of injury and be okay or like but i would go you know what in i've been bested like i got caught in this even if this guy can't finish me one time out of two he will or like you know a world class guy if Hodger Gracie got that cross choke on me I'd be finished so you know I would always almost yeah like look for the weaknesses in my game in competition not run from them or hide from them because as soon as you do that competition that's over that wasn't a street fight and now you're still the same Ian I'm still the same Tom the only difference is if you and I rocked up and did a competition today you and I have an honest honest battle tested assessment of our strengths and weaknesses and uh if you compare that to the guy who just believed in his excuse and didn't go out there and compete and put himself on the line then you and i come out well ahead of that individual when it comes to jujitsu progress and personally <clears throat> i think also mental like personal development too which, to be honest, let's face it, is more important than how good you are at choking people and breaking their bones. It's true. I mean, and that's the beauty of it. It's like you also get used to the the idea of like undergoing pressure and ex, you know real time analysis of what they're doing and looking for the right movement patterns and stuff like that. But what would you say to somebody like, say, I'm 37 and I started jujitsu quite late, and then. I didn't have a chance when I was in the first year. So when I got my blue belt, I think it was just after a year, I thought, oh, brilliant, I'll go and compete. You know, this will be something I need it as a challenge. And then obviously this whole pandemic nonsense. But what for the sort of older grapplers or the sort of, you know, the people who are coming who've got kids and things like that, how should we adapt our game to suit you know, like going against somebody with a six pack and a endless gas can and all this kind of stuff. You know, because it's really hard to, when you see some of these guys and you think, "Well, oh, fuck, how do I, keep, you know, how do I juggle that? How do I keep up with them?" You know, you can't just go and nobble them in the showers with a bat or something. But you know, how can you put it on a level playing field, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely true. I mean, the first thing I think is like rather than saying the playing field isn't level, I think you would need to sort of acknowledge the fact that like you can go to heck masters worlds, or I mean, there's, you know, European masters stuff, or even local tournaments that have masters divisions, if they're big enough and you can go grapple against the same guy or girl as you, you know what I mean? Like there is nothing I like better than seeing at masters worlds, like two people in their seventies going at it. Like, I just think, it's one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen. Having said that, you know, you're only 37, and I mean, I'm just saying, uh, you know, 37 doesn't mean you don't have a six pack either. Like, you know. <laughs> oh, I don't, not at the moment, I've been eating for Scotland. <laughs> you're not rocking up in a wheelchair at 97 asking me this, you know. So I think, uh, to be honest, I don't think um, physicality has that much to do with jujitsu, you know, like. I think intimidation can affect outcomes and I think that's up to us to prevent any of that and just keep that self. I mean, I'm going to use the term internal dialogue. I'm sure there is a more apt and correct expression, but what you say to yourself in your head, the voice inside your head, your self commentary, I don't know. I, I use the term internal dialogue. I think your internal dialogue is one of those things that you just need to control and at times directly question and reverse. So if you see, uh, let's just say you get put in the blue belt division, 80 kilos, and yeah, some jacked up kid on steroids is there and he's jumping around and you're thinking, what the heck? Then, you know, like that could psych you out. But you could also say, man, if this kid needs to take steroids and act like this to feel confident, like I'm going to show him some serious dad strength right now. And we'll just see how tough those six pack muscles are. You know, there's just different internal dialogue. And I think being able to identify your internal dialogue and separate internal dialogue from what reality is, because they're two different things. We know that, like we know how we interpret reality is totally different to the next person. We know this because 
in unbiased crime scene reports, you interview 10 people and they say 10 different things um, and they all are swearing the truth. Uh, so I think, you know, for me at least, I try to arrest, when it comes to competition, Ian, I try to arrest any negative self-talk and let it be and understand it. Like, don't fight against it, but just identify it and then realize that most of the time your self-talk, if you're feeling bad, isn't supporting your best outcomes and uh, and changing that to something just more realistic. Like, not something fake, not like, I'm going to smash this guy. I don't think so. Just being like, I'm confident, you know, I'm a strong, tough, good blue belt who's going to give his all. Like, you know, this guy better be ready for me. I'm not going to be a walkover for any man. And if he thinks I am, he's going to have a very, very unpleasant surprise. You know, I think that's, for instance, like a healthy approach to have um, when it comes to, yeah, addressing and identifying and reversing negative self-talk. Because that's the thing, like, jujitsu competitions don't affect anyone. You know, they're not causing you stress leading up to it or like bad things aren't happening during 99.99999% of competitions. It's the thing in your own head. It's all in your own head, you know? And um, it, it, I'll tell you what, it's the hardest thing in the world to be in control of your own thoughts. I think it's easier to do almost everything else I've done in my life. But I think it's also the most important thing too. So <laughs> probably a labor worth investing in. Because that's the hard, that's a hard thing, isn't it? It's like you see these people who, like, I love seeing the transformation of somebody who's come in into the gym for the first time and you can barely say boo to a mouse. And then after a few weeks there, they get really good, but try to convince them that they're good enough to compete or that they're good in, they're good at jiu-jitsu. And they're like, no, 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 that's no, not me. And it's, you can see that internal dialogue. It's like sometimes the biggest enemy is the, the bit of space between our ears. We kind of yeah. talk ourselves out of these things. So how, have you figured out a way to deal with that anxiety leading up to competitions? You know, how do you deal with overcoming that fear, getting through the sort of anxiety, the nerves leading up to it? Or does it just not come after a few competitions, do you find? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there's definitely a desensitization process that occurs during repeat stimuli, you know, like exposure, like, if you are scared of heights and you jump off enough diving boards, you know, um, that's going to go down. The problem is, of course, people don't jump off diving boards when they're scared of heights. And <laughs> I'm not suggesting people do for the record. But, you know, I think it would be best practice. Um, and so for me, like, I, I, I think I was more emotionally nervous competing when I started competing than anything especially because violence for me was much more serious in my life in the past so like that would almost trigger that and now it I, I wish I was more nervous I I'll go out the night before and not have a care in the world I won't even have a care in the world in the morning I'm competing I have to set alarms to make sure I get there on time and stuff so I think for me like my internal dialogue sort of goes something like this um Oh, well, oh, geez, I'm competing with this guy. I don't know. You might see him. I mean, I know most of the guys that fight at, you know, super heavy and ultra heavyweight at black belt level and stuff internationally. And uh, I compete in brackets where I know the names most of the time, obviously. And, uh, yeah, you know, if I see that, I'm like, whoa, that guy's like a four-time world champ, you know, <laughs> uh, or something. I, um, I think my dialogue is like, man, I can't wait to get out there and just, like, show them what I'm made of. Like, I got this. Like, I've got this. Like, I'm looking forward to this. Um, you know, I have faith in my abilities. I have more faith in my abilities than I have abilities. And that can be dangerous. But when it comes to offsetting fear and concern, then that's a positive thing. I mean, I'm not saying don't be humble. Arrogance is the enemy. But backing yourself, feeling confident in yourself, being okay with the outcome, I think that liberates fear. Because I think that's what people are fearing. They're not fearing the fight. They're fearing losing and how it will affect their self-image. That's my personal opinion, Ian. I love that because that was definitely me at the start. 
Like I went in and the guys who started at the same time as me were a lot younger and, you know, I tried to fit in with them and they were doing like handstand push-ups and they could do all this kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, I'm at least like a foot taller than the majority of them, you know, like a big guy. And when I tried to like be the the lapel player or the fast flexible player that they were I, I got nowhere but as soon as i realized i found out pressure passing i was like oh yeah and it changed jujitsu for me so how can we find out and start practicing our own style you know is that how we stop comparing ourselves do we get to a point where because we're focusing on our own game we stop looking at other people you know, is this the problem with some of this cooker, uh, sort of cookie cutter training that some of these gyms do? You know, they teach yeah. their philosophy. Yeah, past white belt, certainly. I mean, like, there's obviously just, you know, you, you need to learn certain basics. You know, you just can't sort of go into a gym and not do certain basics. But for me, like, I don't know, I do offer, I, I do offer a much more varied and tailored approach to, like, my syllabus and teaching of my students. Um, I'm a unique body type in and of myself. I've been involved in jiu-jitsu when I was a little short, pudgy kid. I've been involved in jiu-jitsu as a 6'4", 60-kilo guy, and I've been involved in jiu-jitsu at 6'4", and 105 kilos as well, which I um, sit at sort of a when I'm um, just hanging around. And so I think like I've seen all these different body types and oh yeah, I mean, can you make all techniques work for every body type? Yep. Are there certain body type shapes, mental dispositions that lead to better success in other techniques? Yep. And I think competition can play into that Ian too, because uh, do you know some of my best techniques have come from competition? And it's like I got swept or tapped by something or something like that. And I uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go practice that. And then I found out that it was like really suited to my game. And like, thank goodness I had that exposed, you know, because I just wouldn't have seen that in my lineage. You know, we just don't do that. Like, <laughs> you know, there's literally been times where that has been the case. So I think that can help too, Ian. But I mean, ultimately uh finding your own style is somewhat easy i do believe the mat just rolling teaches that ian like you know if you were trying to toriander pass and you're a big guy yeah you're just going to get tired of not passing so then you're going to try different stuff and then eventually you're going to pressure pass someone and you're going to go that was bloody easy and then you're going to pressure pass tomorrow and then lo and behold ian's suited to pressure pass and he's practicing pressure passes every day now no one can stop ian's pressure pass so then when it comes to a competitive strategy you are just trying to funnel that match or matches into your areas where you spend the most combat hours and that's what the best competitors do that's why many many competitors just like me do not look at the brackets before we fight or like don't look up our opponents or make individual strategies is that perhaps less than ideal from an outcome based like yes but in terms of it being the best thing for you mentally to give you the best chance of winning and playing your game yes i agree too so the best competitors just drag people into the areas where they have more hours than they do. Because we all compete against people our size. We compete against people our rank, gender, whatever. So at the end of the day, the only way you're really going to have an advantage is luck. So can't control that. So we just delete that. Or conditioning, which we can control, but isn't as important as some people think. And the third one, most importantly, is just hours on the mat. So if you're a four-year blue belt and you go against a two-year blue belt, then you'll probably win. If you do four hours a week and he or she does two hours a week, you'll probably win. But if he only does half an hour a week, but he spends that entire time doing a reverse de la Hiva, you know, lapel spider hybrid, and he pulls guard and puts you in it, that kid could be a white belt. He's going to win that match, you know, because you're just never going to be used to dealing with it. And he is. 
So his mates have pulled the lapel and crushed him and pulled backwards and slammed him and broken the grips and he knows what's going to go wrong and you just don't. So he's ready and you're not like in that position. Just like if you were to fight a non-grappler in a grappling competition, our aim is to try to put people where we're better grapplers than them. So I learned very quickly that at black belt level, um, personally, for, for me, Ian, um, my footlocks, uh, like there, there are plenty of people better at footlocks than me. You know what I mean? I'm just a person who's loved them for a long time, but whether in competition or training, I know that my footlocks are like vastly superior to the average black belt. So like I play that game. It's not what I do to my white belts or blue belts or purple belts at my gym, but that is, you know, my strongest weapons at a higher level, just because they're not familiar with it. So that's what I would say is just get familiar at something. Doesn't need to be fancy. Some of the best guys in our sport uh, have basic games. You know, you mentioned pressure passing, like a wonderful, nice guy, Bernardo Faria. Um, look at him. He basically did one pass and one sweep in his entire career, and he's a five-time world champion, you know, 2015 double gold. So I think that gives us normal guys hope. And he claims he's got a bit of a dad bod and he can't do a cartwheel and he's not a gifted athlete. So who knows, Ian? There might be hope for us yet, mate. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I love because when, um, when I found pressure passing, I thought, yeah, this is good. This works for me. But what does it do about, you know, the flexible guy, the tall guy, the thin guy, the small guy? And I found that if I get them all into the channel or the chain that I wanted, I could, you know, no one could get out of it. And I, I was brilliant and I could pass through and then I suddenly I found, oh, wait, I don't know what to do when I got to side control. And then, oh, I could go from side control to this position, but I didn't know how to get to that position. So I started figuring out, like, chains of commands and like you know how to go from passing the guard to actually putting on a submission but is that something that you've noticed with top performers is that they keep things very basic that they dial in maybe two sweeps two submissions two guard passes and they just get them to world-class level you know what other similarities between the top performers and top competitors have you noticed well, I think what you just said rings very true and is absolutely correct. Um, yeah, even to the point where it might not even be two of each, maybe just one, you know. Um, however, uh, most of the time the top guys are making their living in jiu-jitsu and they've been in it a long time like myself. So we're going to have an extremely broad repertoire and it can be – you go to a seminar, say, with a world champion, and it can be tempting to think, oh, they just know so much, it's so broad, there's so many things I didn't know. But most of the time, in my experience of training with so many of those men, men and women world champions, that uh, they actually have a very small game, and that's why they were able to excel at it. If Ian, if you want to be the best carpenter and the best plumber and the best lawyer and the best, best doctor – good luck to you, but I promise you won't be the best at any of those four <laughs> if you try to be the best at more than about one of those four. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's just a reality. We divide our hours by our techniques. So we must have a broad enough repertoire so that we can take the opportunities presented to us. However, we must have enough depth in that technical repertoire to make sure, especially at a high level, when the shit hits the fan, that you're going to get that choke, that escape, that tap. So how would you start ramping up your training for this? Is this something that you would do like six months away from a competition? Or do you have like... Say if you were wanting to do a competition in, like, say, September and it was, like, January, when would you start ramping up your training? When would you start doing a training camp, hitting the weights and that? Or do you kind of stay competition ready most as close to it as much as possible? Yeah. You know, how do you change your planning? Def, I mean, everything you said is basically true. Um, I suppose from my perspective, Ian, <clears throat> I – um. I used to approach it more like, yeah, I would call it more of like an MMA approach of uh, a, tra um, <clears throat> a training camp, you know, building up 
your both attributes to a peak as well as uh, specific techniques and strategies. I don't do that now. I suppose for me, jiu-jitsu competition is, is about different things for me now. So like I used to, yeah, like think about it in from six weeks to six months, I'd often only try to compete twice a year. Um, there was a couple of years where I didn't lose once. And I mean, I would have only been in, I don't know, seven or eight tournaments or something during those few years or something. It wasn't a lot, but uh, I think it was like blue and purple belt or something. I don't know. I can't remember, but it, uh, I didn't really lose. Um, and it was kind of negative. Like I did these big training camps. I was in great shape. I was so driven. Like, I'm not surprised I did well as a competitor at all. Um, I know I've always had a little bit of talent and stuff and a wide repertoire, but I um, didn't find it that enjoyable. So nowadays, and again, this isn't about optimal results from your competition in terms of medal results, but rather for me, personal results, which is all about peace of mind and personal growth, etc. For me, that was more about um, just competing as I would. Same if I just got in a fight in a car park of a shopping center, like you just are fighting now. So, you know, I tried to keep my conditioning program, my diet and my training uniform year round. In fact, the only thing that changes is because I'm nine times out of 10 competing in the United States or overseas, I, uh, I tend to train a lot less in the last two weeks before competing funnily enough because i uh I, I was just tired of always going into these tournaments like beat up and injured um <laughs> to be honest um yeah like there's been a few tournaments and i've been like literally held together by tape like not as a figure of speech but just truly really legitimately <laughs> you know and uh and that's totally cool and like it never really affects the outcome or anything you know and so I like to just compete where I am, but I think a sensible person would probably do, I think 12 weeks and just something small. So for 12 weeks, you might do a small amount of conditioning a few times a week. And for 12 weeks, you will do one roll before class and one roll after class extra, or maybe just one roll after class and 20 reps of your favorite technique before every class from now till, you know, you compete. I think that's a very healthy balance, you know, so you feel like you're peaking, but you're not stressing yourself out. Um, I've generally found Ian that nine times out of 10, it's not about optimizing performance on the day. It's preventing you ruining your performance on the day. So um, I tend to take a more laid back approach nowadays, but I'd say a 12 week training camp with extra sparring rounds, starting from your feet, certainly a very firm idea of what you're going to do if it goes wrong. But more importantly, what you are going to do as soon as you slap hands, as soon as you slap hands, you know, just know what you're going to do. You're going to pull guard. What if he pulls guard? What pass? What sweep? They're the two things you need to know because that's what's going to happen. That's really, you know, because that is actually really surprising to me because I thought, like, when you see these other guys talking, they're almost like, you know, you need to be running in the morning and you need to be drinking raw eggs and then you need to be sacrificing a goat and, you know, you need to be having, like, 50,000 extra reps. And I, I really like that approach of not damaging yourself before it because, like, sometimes at jiu-jitsu, like, I'll go in and... Like I do the podcast, I've got a full-time job, I've got other stuff going on as well. And the people will be saying, oh, are you coming to Mogi as well? Are you coming to the kettlebell class? Are you coming to... And, you know, it's like every night and it's like the no gi, for example, and the gi stuff we do is like an hour of t technique and then there'll be an hour of... Wow, that's a lot of and, ah, and, you know, it's like I'm an older git like myself. I can't always cope with that level of intensity so i have to be very kind of like picky of what i do so a lot of times like the nogi classes kind of fell on the day i would always record podcasts but you know some people might have to go pick up the kids or it might be a date night or it could be a job they have to work slightly late so how would you pick in those kind of classes and those kind of setups you know i mean would you do rolling once a week or would you 
come in just for rolling or I've seen it done with different people, different approaches. I've seen get younger ones go in for everything and I've tried it and it almost killed me after a few weeks. You know, how would you set it up in those kind of where the classes are structured, you know, you can't just go in and train on the moves you would like to practice, yeah. but you've kind of got like a set curriculum. Yeah, I'd probably just, you know, do a bit of my extra own drilling before or after class. Um, way to increase the cardio without increasing injury risk. And I think if I had to go back in my career, um, this is quite controversial, but I do believe um, it to be true. I would have done more drilling and less rolling. Um, there's no replacement for rolling and it's a very important part, but I would have certainly, certainly done more drilling than rolling in fact, I would have certainly increased my drilling leading up to a competition. I think increasing your rolling uh, quantity before a competition isn't always effective. Increasing your rolling intensity before competition absolutely is. Um, so I think going to a little bit of a higher intensity, shorter duration of rolling, if anything, or same duration, higher intensity. So what would you do? I mean, do you follow the the kind of like memory um how do you say it of like you know you do the movement and you just keep learning it and you repeat it over and over and over again or are you kind of leaning more towards a kit dale approach where you learn the concepts behind how to sweep somebody how to submit somebody and then you learn to actually figure out a movement based on the principles from it or do you do a mixture of them? You know, how do you learn the techniques and dial these into you know such world class levels that you that you have? Um, I mean, uh, I think a combination of the two. I think anyone who sells instructionals, like for instance, like Kit, Kit Dale, for instance, you know, um, uh, good, I'm not sure how involved he is still in jiu jitsu, but you know, like great competitor from my uh, country and um, funny guy, you know, um, got instructionals, all the works, you know. And uh, he's he's aligned, yeah, with the just roll, 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 roll. Um, and for instance, you know, while we're talking of that particular uh, athlete, um, you know, he, he, he's also like a, a total physical specimen that was a naturally totally gifted athlete th whose behaviours of rolling only during a class would have got him kicked out of 99% of academies. Um, you know what I mean as well? So I actually don't mm. think that's for a normal person. Uh, there are people with good business instincts that can go start a business and they don't need to read a business book or have a mentor or they're just going to go it and they're just going to do it. And that's not everybody. And I find that jujitsu on average attracts people who need the self confidence boost, not people who need to express their own self confidence through um, just rolling and trying to express their own jujitsu, you know, you're trying to build something in them. So I think for people who aren't total physical beasts, no rolling only isn't the answer. And, you know, to be frank as well, rolling for the quantity required to actually develop the breadth and depth of skills not only isn't necessarily the best way to learn it because of the high stress nature of it causing too much of a uh, long learning curve per se, like, because you're just not going to be able to do things correctly for a long time. And now you risk having that adrenaline hardwire poorly executed techniques into your system. Um, so I think for me, like I would say, you have to understand principles and concepts. That's the first thing. But then you go into specific details of the techniques, which is how you illustrate and understand and apply those said concepts. And then finally, obviously, putting them in live rolling, pressure testing them, finding out what goes wrong. So you can make a plan B. It's time for a quick break. There are millions of potential products to buy, so how do you know which ones are worth your hard-earned money? Simple. You go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and explore those that will transform and improve your life. You'll find deals, listener exclusives, and special offers with some great companies. Recommendations are 100% honest and only on items Ian has tried or believes in. The companies showcased will make you a better man in all areas of your life. 
Simply go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and level up. Now, the the question I'm dreading, um, because it means I would have to start eating like a grown-up again. Now, during COVID, we're all just munching and grazing 24-7. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I think you'd try to beat me up if you saw some of the stuff I was eating for a while. You know, I wasn't, I've never had a great diet to kind of start off with, but... For somebody like myself or, you know, the guy who's just started jujitsu at 40 or whatever, you know, how should we implement diet changes, start eating healthy? You know, do we bother with supplements, with protein powders? You know, and I started taking vitamin C and vitamin D because of, well, vitamin D because I live in Scotland. Yeah, yeah we, don't, we don't really see a sun. But, you know, I mean, how can we start really eating healthier, have you found anything that kind of works for your students? You know, not people who are doing it professionally, but people who are kind of just wanting to get fitter and healthier and get the cardio up, but not eat like a McDonald's for breakfast every day. You know, but what do, like, what do you think about cheat meals and stuff like that? How serious do we need to take the diet side of things? Well, I mean, for me personally, um, I think I've, I've tiptoed this line and I've fallen over either side several times so i have spent not just weeks or months but you know i would say like a year or more with a horrible diet i mean so and you know before you justify your own diet let me justify to you what i've spent many years doing at different times um okay so like my total intake is pretty high. Like there were times where I would eat up to 9,000 calories a day with an average of about 6,000. And paradise to me. <laughs> that would include maybe four burgers from McDonald's that day, at least a pizza, maybe three other, four other burgers from somewhere else. I don't know, four, five, six, seven like cokes or something um dessert as well snacks like there have been times absolutely when my diet has just been crazy and the problem being with that is i train so much that i can do all that and still have the six pack abs and everything else however obviously well health isn't on the outside really health is about what's on the inside and you know, having good cardio is more is not just about how out of breath you are. It's also how healthy your heart and cardiovascular system is. And uh, I get my blood done every three months uh, to check all my levels, make sure I'm not overtraining, etc. And I would say that, like, when I saw the negative health effects for that, that's what prompted me to change my diet per se. Although it's nowhere near as good as it was at a time. I just try to be reasonable and I try to listen to my body and, you know, like right now I know uh, that there is a whole bunch of things like, yeah, like junk that I'd cut out right now that I'm only eating because, you know, yeah, we've got these restrictions in place and a lot of things that I'm not consuming that I would go back to as soon as, you know, gyms reopen. Um, and for those things, I would say maybe potentially like, yeah, a protein shake with a workout maybe some creatine, you know, it's about as far as my supplementation sort of goes, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I don't think you can let diet get in the way of you enjoying life. And I don't think, you know, you want to let your diet get in the way of you having a long life either. I've been too extreme with it in the past. I'm very much an all or nothing guy. And I've gone from like, I, I did not eat even one animal product in six years. Like I thought plant-based was the answer and I was like six years just like hardcore you know and um and then like I've done the opposite almost as well for lengths of time so you just try to make the most reasonable decisions and I think most humans have a pretty good little diagnostic system of whether things are good or bad for them in their gut and so hopefully you know viewers can just trust that and yeah if they want to put a bit of muscle on sure add some creatine you'll probably add a couple of pounds you know um, add some protein, you know, if you're not taking protein shakes, you know, you're probably going to add five, 10 pounds of muscle or something, you know, it's not going to go on forever. And, you know, you hit a genetic limit kind of probably like what I think I've done, but 
you know, you're just doing everything you can do. And just like you were talking about rolling before on that note, genetic limits and things like that, you know, like I don't think it's any different for any sport, but there's certainly a, a vast majority of people at the high level competition scene that um, do use performance enhancing drugs. And I don't actually mind that from a competition standpoint. Like, like I said, I, I think like Dan Gable, like if you need that, you've already, you've already showed me weakness, but, more of a case of the fact that those people can roll for so long without getting injured. They don't overtrain like a normal guy would. Um, and that's another factor to bear in mind too. And that's why I, I'm a, sometimes a big fan of drilling because people that aren't on, I don't know, whatever, steroids, growth hormone, IGF, insulin, SARMs, I don't know, whatever the cool kids take these days, there's always something new going around. Um, you know, like without them, you're not going to heal from injuries as quick. You're going to get injured more. And mentally I've found like you will fatigue, uh, faster too. Um, you know, you get burnt out, you overtrain more. And I'm, so I'm not trying to take away from people who take those drugs and train hard. Like I'm saying that they can train even harder. I am just saying that sometimes we, if you don't do those things need to have realistic realistic expectations that you are just a human after all, you know? This is why I love chatting to you because you take, like, you know, because the, the problem with my podcast, for example, is you get to, you know, chat to people about very specific things and they give you, like, 50 things to do and that. And so I think we, we all kind of go, oh, I'm going to do a bit of this, I'm going to run 50 miles a day, I'm going to go and eat healthy, and, you know, and before you do it, you don't do nothing of it because yeah. you can't keep it up and, You've just got this way of saying it, and you just go, ah, you feel the relax. You feel, you know, you're so cool. I mean, it's been almost 55 minutes, and I've still got pages of questions. I mean, if you're up for it, I've got, we can go three, four, five, six, or any more. But for, could you just give a quick overview for somebody who's thinking, okay, I like the idea of competing. What's it like, you know, like on the actual day? You know, what kind of thing do you eat? How often, how long do you have to be in for warm ups? Um, how, you know, how long is it between fights? And, you know, what, what goes through your mind during the stage? You know, what have you learned? Because you've fought some amazing people, you've done some amazing, successful, you've won tournaments. What have you r r found works for you in particular in a competition? Yeah, I mean, for me, not a thorough, I mean, this is going against what a lot of people will tell you, but not a thorough warm up. Yeah, a, a, a shorter warm up, um, if, if any, almost at all, like a quick stretch. That's very much against a lot of people's thinking, and I totally acknowledge that. Um, not giving myself away personally before the tournament is one of my biggest ones. What I mean by that is uh, I was confused by this when I was told of like my coach's like last Masters World title when he's like, you know, like I just got a hoodie and I put the hood up and I put my hands in my pockets and I put headphones on and I don't look at anyone before I compete. Like all of my energy is just internalized and it's for me. Um, I find that that's a good approach. In terms of what people can expect in a tournament, nine times out of 10, it works like this. You rock up, you'll rock up an hour early. Um, it will be running early on time or most likely late. There'll be a whole bunch of people and you'll weigh in. And then when your name's called up, you'll go over and wait until a fight or two is done. And you go on, you shake the ref's hand, you shake their hand and they say kombach and you wrestle for five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever belt rank you are. And, uh, then, you know, you shake the guy's hand and you give him a hug and they raise one of your arms and you chat when you come off the mat and you talk about where you train and that match and how good their technique was and, like, how strong you felt their grips were and you got, like, a friend and a buddy and, like, that's match one done. And then, uh, depending on how deep your brackets are, you might have a couple of matches in a day. You know, I've had up to over a dozen in a day, you know, like... Um, then, you know, you might have 20 minutes and you're going to feel like after that first match that you can't even walk, let alone, you know, fight again. 
it's like a fight or flight instinct. It says like, go back to the cave, man. Just go back to the cave now. Like, you know, you've already fought one saber tooth today. You know, you don't need to fight another one. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so you just stay in there and then your arm and forearm and back pump all go. And then all of a sudden you're feeling okay and you, you're going to not want to do it, but you just will. And then your second fight will always be so much easier and more relaxing than your first. Um, so that's how a normal day would go down. And then whether you win or lose, end up with medals or not, you're going to go home feeling really good about yourself, just as if you stood up to a bully or something and got beat up, but you stood up for them, you know, you stood up to them. I think you would still be proud of yourself. Um, I think jujitsu is a lot like that. I love, I just love the way you put it because I think a lot of people, myself included, have like made it far more extensive than it probably is. You know, we probably overcomplicated it in terms of, Oh, you've got to go in with this game plan. You've got to have this set training schedule. And, you know, it's just going in, rolling with somebody else in a gym where it's a bit stricter results are controlled. You know, and I think that's the thing is we blow this stuff way out in our head. It's just like men in general, the stuff that we do, you know. But we've got such a big ego, a lot of us, that we think, oh, no, we can't possibly go and lose against somebody because then we might be less of a man yeah. in that situation. And and it's so true. Like, and, and that what you just said, you know, like most men will never have, uh, whether it's the self-confidence or self-awareness to identify and definitely speak of the issue you just spoke about because whether men admit it or not, and every man out there listening to this knows what I'm talking about, until you're confident and competed as like a combat athlete or something, men are constantly, whether they know it or are conscious about it or not, like worried about violence and wondering what would happen and questioning their abilities and thinking what ifs or what would I do in this situation. And it's either false bravado or genuine fear. And it's linked to so many different things and we don't really understand it, you know? And uh, I think when you just separate that and you, you start to reframe that you can actually argue the opposite. Like for instance, say you and I, Ian, we're over in Scotland. Where do you live in Scotland? It's in Glasgow in the United yeah, Kingdom. I have, uh, Not Scotland. <laughs> I, have, I have two students in Glasgow. Like as in, I have two students that literally have moved to me in the last few years from Glasgow so small world. Anyhow, um, yeah, so say you and I are over in Glasgow and, uh, you know, three gentlemen, you know, want, uh, want to have a bit of a punch on with us or something and it's just you and I and uh, we've got two mates and we get to choose and we get to pick a third for some epic, false, mythical street fight that's going down now on some Glasgow pub street. You've got a guy that is muscles, tough talks confidence whatever but you know never been in an altercation before and then you've got a guy who's probably maybe he's lost more fights than he's won but you know what he's not going to take a backward step and he's going to be there on your back until his last breath and he's not going to be afraid to get stuck in he's not afraid to lose he's not afraid to hit he's not afraid to win i pick that the second guy every time every time um, just as I would pick a seasoned competitor over a hyper athletic, talented newbie in a jujitsu competition. Um, and I think then that's when you realize that that, that is your worst case scenario. Like let's imagine you compete three times in the next year, Ian, you have five matches a day and you lose every single one of them. And you know, what's funny. I have students that have done what, what I just said, like that's hard to achieve. Like just statistically, that's hard to achieve. Um, you know what? Everyone's going to go, you know what, man? That guy doesn't care. He goes out there. He throws down. He fights hard. He's not afraid to lose. Like every single person in your academy is going to look up to you. And then sooner rather than later, you're going to realize that losing meant nothing. And it's just going to drive your will to win because now you've lost the fear of losing. And I think that's incredibly powerful, you know? So, uh, yeah, men, we just say all this bullshit stuff to ourselves. I'm no different. I'm a man just like you. And, uh, 
our testosterone and all these dumb things say a lot of dumb things in our heads. And sometimes it's us to put a bit of a rational hat back on and go, hold on, you know, my family are going to actually respect me more if I go out there and come up short and keep a good attitude and don't give up. And I think you're a father yourself. I'm a father myself with my ex-wife and uh, I have two amazing kids. I have half of the time in my life. And uh, for me, a lot of competing was about them. You know, like when my body started to break down a little bit, I had a lot of extreme sports injuries that are just surgeries I never had, um, to be honest. And, uh, you know, obviously they flare up when someone cranks things on you. But I kept competing because I wanted to be a good example for my students. And I wanted to be a good example, perhaps most importantly, for my children. So that if they loved soccer, but they were a hopeless soccer player, I would hope that their dad has given them enough of an example to say that you should go and be involved in what you enjoy and it doesn't matter what happens. And if I could pass that on to my children, just that one thing, forget ethics, forget, you know, I don't know, anything else. If I could pass on one thing to my children, I would hope that I could pass on to my children that they proceed you know, I'm sort of half stealing a quote here, but they would proceed confidently in the directions of their dreams without fear or worrying about what other people would think of them if they came up short and they truly just followed the path that they felt was the path destined for them and they didn't fear it, whether it's being a doctor or ballet or a carpenter or an artist, of that would be the greatest gift that I could get as a parent knowing my kids had that and would go and live their lives for them, not anyone else. They would believe in themselves and follow their bliss and be okay with the outcome. That to me would just be the greatest gift I could get as a dad. And it would be the greatest gift I could give as a dad as well. I love that because that, that was actually one of my questions was how did things change when you became a father? You know, did it affect you in any way? And I think it's it's really beautifully put how you put it and you can feel that passion when you speak about it. And, you know, a lot of people use it as an excuse almost, you know, like, oh, I've got kids now, I can't compete and stuff like that. And I was thinking, like, I would love to go out and do stuff because of that. You know, I was thinking, well, I've, I would, you know, was it... Um, is it art imitations? No. Life imitations, art. Or, I can't remember there's a phrase for it where, you know, the kids, they do what they see you do and they want to imitate you. So why not go and do everything and show them that they can, it doesn't matter if you're the, the worst at it. If you're having fun, go and do it. And I think that's what I lost was I forgot how to have fun doing jiu-jitsu for a while. And I think the COVID-19 thing has actually helped me because it's given me a time away from it. And now I'm going... I need to choke somebody out. I need to get back to it. I need to beat somebody up. You know, it's, it's, it's a strange sport, isn't it? It's like, how can we enjoy the aches and the pains and the chokes? and the? But it's like the brotherhood as well. It's the what you get from it. And I think that's what a lot of people forget. And I think we take it sometimes too seriously. Yeah. And we forget the soul from it, you know? I mean, look, the reality is, like, it's even if I'm involved with teaching, like, say a military group or something like that and you think well these guys technically actually might need this the funny reality is they really don't like the time when a navy seal actually needs to do a triangle choke to someone something has gone so wrong so far it's just not needed like do they have the rest of the people yeah but are there three other guys behind them with machine guns at all times yeah do they have knives and handguns and everything else? And yeah, they do. So, you know, like I think sometimes even the people that like you would say, oh, they need to do it. They need to worry about the outcome. These are men and women or whatever with their lives on the line, you know, protecting a country and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I even think of those people as like, you guys don't need this stuff. This is just an interesting way for maybe your government to spend money to keep you guys fit and interested and get you upskilled, you know? And I think when it comes to us dads, you know, or mums for that matter, like uh, several mums in my academy compete. In fact, my most inspiring competitor 
is a woman by the name of Kathy in my academy, and she is 57 years old. She is a mother of seven, and she has a business, and she trains five times a week, and she competes, and she's competed many events. She always gets put in the adult division, and she's fighting these like 20 year old girls that look mean as with six packs and Kathy's Kathy, you know, like, and, uh, she inspires more people than anyone else in my Academy. She just does because she goes out there and win or lose. She's going to have a good attitude. And you know, when I say to all my students that don't compete or give me the excuse, you know, like, Oh, I've got kids. I've got a business. I can't get injured. It just doesn't suit me. I don't have an ego anymore. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, that's weird because that 57-year-old mother of seven over there is doing it and she's done heaps and she competed after only a few months of training. So don't worry about it, man. I'm sure you've got a much better excuse than her and stuff. So, you know, as long as you can sleep at night knowing that she's doing it, then I'm cool with it too. You know, like I sometimes think I'm a bit of a dick calling people on their shit because uh, I just think competition I think you have to, don't you, sir? needs to do once. And... I have photos, like I take photos at Masters Worlds of the elderly competitors competing um, because it is just so inspiring to me. I have a photo of two sets of grapplers competing and uh, one at Blue Belt and one at Black Belt, women and men, and both of them had pure white hair, not silver, not grey, pure, like I'm 85 years old, white hair <laughs> like and um yeah uh to me i just think that sets a very strict level of the point at which we can let our emotions get in the way of us going about jiu-jitsu competition just like if we were complaining that you know you had to drink tap water not i don't know sparkling mineral water we just need to remind ourselves that, you know, there's a kid dying every five seconds because the water he drank had contaminants in. And uh, that tends to take a lot of our suffering away. And we go, oh, shit, first world problem, shut the heck up. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think jiu competition is just like that. Uh, it's all in our heads. There's nothing to be afraid of. We're all parents. And if you are a parent, if you are someone like, then definitely compete so that when your daughter or son has her clarinet recital and she's nervous, she's not going to let her term be wasted away worrying. She's going to give her best. And she knows if she falls on her face, she saw dad fall on his face and get choked out in 10 seconds of his first mat. And he just had a big smile on his face and said, I learned my lesson. I can't wait to get back in there. I made a new friend. I faced my fears. And, like, that's just a very powerful message I think we can give to our children. Um, I wish someone had given that to me when I was young because I have always – I was always deathly fearing outcomes. You know, I wouldn't, like – I mean, <laughs> this is a long time ago, but, you know, like, I wouldn't approach a girl in a bar. Why? Because what if she rejects me? How am I going to feel about my self-image? But the reality is, Ian, I had no realistic, honest self-confidence or image. Otherwise, I would have gone up and spoken to her. So the people worried about losing some form of self-image when competing, if they lose, you just need to say that if you're worried about that, you don't have it to begin with. So don't worry, mate. You can't lose what you don't have. And the very thing you're avoiding, competition is the very thing that will give you what you think it will take away from you. And that's as powerfully and honestly and justly as I can say what competition gave me. I thought competition would take away X, Y, Z. Little did I know that I never had X, Y, and Z and competition gave me those very things. It's, that's probably one of the best answers I've had yet. I love that idea of you know, it's you're actually thinking it'll take away from you what it's actually going to give you, and that blew me away. I just, it's one of those things that, well, to actually mention it with Dane as well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's super hard, but that's why I think you're so successful is that 
you cover this sort of stuff. You know, you you go into the the dark side of it that a lot of people avoid, and you know, you, like on your um, YouTube channel, you have like Pierre, the struggling grappler, yeah. and you know they they look at like older stuff. You you mention your about your clients. You just cut through all the noise and you tell people about what it is realistically and how it's going to change their life. And I really hope just people listening to this have you know have now completely changed their mind I mean, i'm definitely want to compete when i go back um hopefully that's going to be soon but i mean i know we're well over a time but how is the covid19 sort of affecting you like as a sort of businessman are you finding is there going to be restrictions for the next while before you can get going back in yeah. because i think you're, you're changing lives and you're inspiring people and you know you're doing your purpose in life and i, I love seeing the success you're going to but i mean when you are allowed to go back, have you got a date yet? Um, are you wanting to compete again? What's the, going to be the the next stage for you? Well, I um, I mean, I was flown home a month early from the United States on one of the last, you know, passenger flights back, um, and uh, cause we shut our borders. But uh, I've got lots of seminars that I certainly can't wait to do, and people that I want to see around the world um that i was meant to do um and i'm certainly looking forward to that i mean yeah sure like i mean it's funny because like i can i can tell you that i've lost my motivation to compete but do i look forward to going to worlds and competing or doing a few like a uh, no gi invitational type events or whatever over the next year and do i see myself saying yes to every opportunity yeah i do <laughs> so I, and, and and yeah so like i don't think you need to bring up like the motivation to compete i think like uh i i i am constantly told by my doctor and people that know me like you're right it's probably time you focus on your academy and stop doing this and i'm like yeah 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 you know i'll rest when i'm dead i'll i'll, I'll just do this next tournament or i'll just fly over for worlds this time i'll just fly over for nogi worlds i'll just fly over for pan ams i literally said those three things just in the last six months so um, <laughs> I think I'm sure I'll be traveling, I'll be teaching, I'll be competing. I just want to get my own gym back up and running, like just for my students. And, and, and I am one of the students of my gym as well. Like obviously I'm the head professor, but like that academy gives me just as much or more than any of my students, I think. So right now, yes, despite having zero cases, we could potentially – like potentially there's like ambiguity in our laws that could allow me to open up actually in one week's time. And uh, some gym owners are talking about doing that and taking a bit of a risk. I am aligned with thinking like that due to the fact that I don't think there's a safety risk. It would only be a financial risk where I risk say a $10,000 fine. It's got to the point to be honest with you, Ian, um, the, uh, I've seen many otherwise happy with jujitsu students fall into somewhat of a depression during this era. I even had a student that would uh, train with me and train elsewhere around my local town, um, you know, take his own life uh, in this period. And there's just so much of me that can't, can't help to think that uh, that wouldn't have happened if our doors were open. And it's not the first time that's happened to me and it's not the last time. And uh, other jiu-jitsu coaches know that that's a part of our job. We bring in people that are sometimes uh, struggling, actually most of the time. And sometimes, uh, you know, jiu-jitsu is not enough to save that person. Because that's something, I mean, I struggle myself with depression and, you know, I've had to go on and off antidepressants a few times. And I know what it's like when you get to that point of it. It's the release, but it's also the connection. You know, it's you cut out all the first world bullshit and you learn to be a man again. You learn to have fun again. You learn to be physical again. And, you know, you're, you're physically active and you're really getting into stuff. And it, I mean, jiu-jitsu did change my life and I made, I became over, I overcomplicated it and I can see friends on Facebook or I can see all these kind of chat rooms and people, how much it means to them and how much people like yourself mean to, you know, guys and this is why I'm more than happy to continue paying my, like, my gym subscription so it's still there when I come back to it and I think that it's a really difficult time for gym owners and 
I think that's something that we forget about is everybody's gone on about our schools and stuff like that, but me- mental health is such a big issue and jujitsu helps so many people, but we're talking about it being stage four in the UK and that's months away yet. And, and so many guys have not, no other release, you know? Yeah. And you know, it's hard. I mean, like for instance, uh, and, and like this is, I mean, so, uh, I mean, I, I personally think this is just the off topic statement here, you know, but, I personally think that um, like one of the big, for instance, a, a crisis we have in the Western world is um, military taking their lives with PTSD. I mean, still, I think the statistics are up towards uh, 20 a day in the United States alone, you know, and um, I know we're all worried about this COVID and everything like this, but I think we also need to understand that if we're not taking care of people's mental health, I, I could list for you, not that I would obviously, clearly, not even in a private setting, but I could, could you know, make you aware of more than a dozen people I know that will credit the fact that they didn't take their life one night when they put a gun to their head or a noose around their neck because they went and they just did jujitsu class. And, you know, like... I, and it's it's crazy to say that I say something like a dozen, but I'm not exaggerating, you know. And sometimes I think like, wow, has there been a massive increase in suicides with people that were using jujitsu as their only and most effective coping strategy against PTSD, which I think it really is. And so I'm keen for the whole world to reopen. Everyone can train when they want. I mean, you guys are living different realities in Europe and America to Australia. So we're in different settings, but I mean, I'm left without money. My overheads of my gym still go like nothing stops. And uh, some bigger businesses in my country, you know, got up to $30,000 in just cash grants. But, you know, if some of our smaller businesses, we just didn't, we didn't earn enough to qualify for them or we didn't, you know, our companies weren't set up in the right way for them to be registered and all these different little things. And it's, it's hard. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Granted that I left, you know, the business world and everything to get into jujitsu and I've tried to keep my living expenses you know, under control, but it still doesn't feel good to spend my children's inheritance just staying alive because my government said I can't run my business, even though that there are no cases in my state. That can be a hard pill to swallow, you know? And so I think I will be opening up next Monday um, because uh, next Monday we're allowing like footy, rugby, stuff like that. So if you can tell me that you can do a scrum or a maul in rugby and you and I can't grapple, come on. <laughs> like, no, I will not oh, uh, it, it just... like, you know, like I, I feel like at the moment, my particular government's kind of discriminated against perhaps us. Uh, and even for the record, we actually had one of our government officials specifically say the sentence, it will be a long time before sports like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu go back. And I didn't even think that this member of parliament would have even heard the term Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, let alone feel the need to actually single us out and give us depressing news. So, uh, you know... You know fine well that guy got caught by a spazzy white belt on the first day <laughs> yeah. and just he came to white belt. Fuck that. <laughs> oh lord, yes, probably he probably was. That's right, he was probably the eager beaver white belt, and then he got footlocked by a new guy, and now he's like, "That's it, I'm done." You, you, you don't recognise him, do you? You didn't give him a footlock one day when you were training. Him. <laughs> yeah, prob- probably, <laughs> probably it wouldn't surprise me. Definitely. But no, I think um, like I'm keen to get back onto it. Um, what I saw Ian was uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of my US friends and gym owners uh, went back ahead of time directly against government orders and threats, and got to the point where they would have to lock their doors during the session and put a sign on there saying like, "Make sure you have a warrant." Like, literally, there was a doormat made specifically that said, come back with a warrant because of this. (laughs) Um, 
because obviously some of these things, and I think we're going to know this as time goes down the track, I think there's been some breaches in some laws and freedoms to protect, and we're trying to protect people. Like, I'm not some conspiracy theorist guy. Everyone's trying to protect people. The government aren't trying to screw our lives over for no reason. Well, at least that's my opinion. I'm not a, you know, conspiracy theorist type guy. And so I just hope we are able to get back into it. And uh, I plan on kind of taking a stand this Monday coming. And <laughs> I suppose it might have to wait to our third podcast uh, because, you know, I might start some corona outbreak and get thrown in prison. But I have a feeling there's <laughs> 2 million people in my state and zero cases for the last, I think, since the 7th of May. So more more than two weeks, you know, like what, like, nearly three weeks since our last case we have not like come on Ian like what am I going to wait for like I just uh you know what I'm what I think is going to be funny Ian we're going to go back to class we're finally eventually going to be able to go back and you know sometimes you'll be at the gym it might be dust or something and someone will sneeze it's just an allergy or something and I tell you what no one will want to be that guy well, before we got locked down, I did that. I was on a bus, and there, it was one of those seats where you're facing somebody, and I sneezed because my hay fever had started up. You would have thought I had just drop kicked a puppy out a window, and people were kind of looking at me, and this lady pulled her scarf up over her mouth, and I just thought, I wonder if I should just start coughing just to get a clear space and I get away from everybody. You're like, but it's just, uh, it's a really difficult. I mean, because we've never had like the Spanish flu and pandemics and all this, we're all kind of trying to do our own thing. And I think nobody kind of knows what's coming of it, but we, I think we're going on the Thursday coming to look at like maybe going to the first stage of things reopening and all this kind of stuff. But, it's who knows. I mean, the thing is, America's reopening. Um, maybe that'll be the third podcast is how do we do it in a nuclear war zone? And how do we, you know, number four will be how do we survive a Mad Max territory using jiu jitsu? I'm going to be honest with you. I was in Arkansas. No, uh, yeah, well, Arkansas, when the restrictions and everything kicked off, I had to shut my gym down from the other side of the world. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going for a walk in the forest. And it was funny because we went to Arkansas, so we went to have a bit of a walk. And uh, it was St. Patrick's Day, actually. And I thought to myself, like, because people in America really started to panic. Many people I know stocked up massively on ammo and bought guns that weren't gun owners. Like, there was, like, a proper panic. And uh, to be honest with you, Ian, um, this is a childish statement, but I was kind of hoping for some kind of something cool, like some big shake-up. Like, I was at least hoping for you know, that I'd have to go live in the wild and not be able to go to the supermarket and have to hunt for my own food or zombie apocalypse. I mean, I don't ask for much as a man, Ian, but I was kind of hoping for something. (laughs) Like, I really was, to be honest. It was, you know, like, I say that lightly, of course, but, like, I really was hoping for some sort of bigger shake-up because it feels like the whole world's had this big shake. And I suppose until we see our final mortality causatory statistics which may never be there i think no one knows are all these deaths correlated or caused my instinct is correlated but other people like so you've got people that say 0.02 percent and you've got people that say two percent fatality rates it's pretty big that's a hundred times and they've both been in official documents so you think, what's going on with this? All I can say is this didn't show that the world wasn't ready for a pandemic. This didn't show that our healthcare systems were overtaxed. I don't think it showed anything like that, Ian. What I think it showed is just how much fear is in society, just how much anxiety and stress and panic and just a lack of confidence in people's ability to be safe and keep themselves safe. I think it's totally showed that. I don't think Corona is the pandemic. I think maybe human fear is like, and uh, I'm not trying to take away, you know, from the severity of this, 
but I'm also just trying to be a realist. And uh, until we can look back at this and see global death rates and compare them to last year, I'm not sure if we're going to have good enough statistics to understand what we're even dealing with. But I, like you, even with young kids and us ourselves, we're in such low risk categories that I would like to think that our worlds could be reopened. I mean, have you seen that pictures of people who, I think it was like China and that, where they've just locked, because they locked down, there was no pollution in places that had, you know, nobody had seen there and the dolphins were back into the Venice canals and all that. And you're thinking, are we the virus? You know, I know it's like the Matrix kind of thing, but you think uh, the humans have made the virus and it's, and when it, you sometimes think and you look back and go, it just shows how, like, some people were saying about, oh, I learned, you know, you have to wash your hands and sing happy birthday twice now. And I'm thinking, if you were to be told to wash your hands after going to the toilet, you've got bigger problem, problems than a bloody virus. <laughs> yeah, if somebody had taught you that when you were a kid, it's a bit kind of... But you, know, uh, it, you know what? It is so true. And we talk about, oh, it's changed our lives and you have to wash your hands. But, yeah, like... I don't know, like my mum taught me when I was, I don't know, four years old that you go to the toilet, wash your hands. But you and I both know for a fact here and every bloke listening to this knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you and I go to a pub and it's, you know, 10 p.m. and there's 10 blokes at the urinals, at least eight or nine walked out without washing their hands. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> problem for a long time. Like, <laughs> and then they'll go and eat it's why there's hand and everything as well, like you know what I mean. <laughs> like, it's one of the few places you can find hand soap is in a in a gym, uh, pub toilet. Like, yeah, it's just pretty funny, you know. Like, I'm not sure, but so I think, yeah, you know, like, well, was you a bit of a shake up? He gave us a little bit, it tapped us out, made us realize, you know, that maybe our our global hygiene practices could be improved and how much, you know, we were taking everything for granted. We definitely had a sort of a a 10th apple effect per se. Um, And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just looking forward to it reopening. But I was just going to say my laptop has officially told me that I am about to run out of battery. So this hour and a half fantastic (laughs) part two of our little podcast here might have to come to an end, my friend. No worries. Well, we'll definitely get number three in a a charge earlier, but... For anybody who's listening, I mean, I'll put it all together and I'll edit bits here and there, but um, how can people find you? you know, what do you want them to take from sure. it? Sure. Um, I mean, anyone is welcome to contact me. Um, you can find me. My email address is listed on my website, thegrapplingacademy.com. And uh, you can follow me on social media. My Instagram handle is Tom Davey BJJ. Um, yeah, feel free, you know, check out, I've got like five or 600 free videos on YouTube. Um, I love to connect with people that, you know, feel connected with me and, uh, yeah, I look forward to doing part three. And if I think, yeah, we could leave viewers and listeners with, uh, with anything from this, I think that realization that having fear actually like, uh, you know, what you think it's going to take away it actually is giving you and vice versa is just so true like you think you're going to lose your self-confidence and image and respect if you lose in jiu-jitsu and you find it's the best builder of those few things that i know i mentioned an an opposite example where i would say oh i might have been a 16 year old or 18 year old and i was too scared to approach a girl in a bar or something like that you know And because why you're worried about feeling rejected and being lonely and not having a partner. Well, guess what's going to happen if you keep that fearful attitude in your head and don't approach girls, you're going to end up lonely and approach with no self-confidence. So I think if people could learn that, that there's healthy fear, like when you see a saber toothed tiger and you go best run now, that's healthy fear. But first world fears, like the fears that don't involve wild animals ripping you to shreds are mostly unfounded and not only untrue but direct lies like opposite 
to the truth, direct opposite. Whatever you think you're going to get, you're going to not. Like whatever you think you have now, you don't have and you're going to get it by facing the fear or whatever you think you're going to lose, you're actually going to get more of and find out you never had it all along. I think if I could have told myself something from this interview, you know, 20 years ago, it would be that. I wish someone had told me that. Well, that's it for another week, and thank you for listening. It's now time to take what you've learned and use it to develop and enhance your life with the key points mentioned. Listen, try it, embrace it, use it, and crush it. Now's your time to hit that next level in your life. If you liked this episode, then please leave a comment on the show notes or a review of the show on your podcast platform. Everything helps evolve the show. Until next week, keep seeking the next level in your life.